There's no season like recruiting season in Gainesville now that Billy Napier is here, and 2023 is probably going to end up with a very fun recruiting class for the Gators, and joining me will be John Garcia, Locked On's recruiting insider, to talk about it here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Joining me now for Locked On Gators is John Garcia, Locked On's recruiting insider, and I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions apply. And John, we're two weeks now from the time of recording this away from the early signing period opening, and we're... At the time of recording this, it's four hours before DJ Lagway commits, so not talking DJ here. Um, We're talking 2023 here, wrapping up that cycle, and we're going to start with who we've started with so often, Quay Rousseau, James Smith. We know that the Florida Gators staff was uh, with a home visit yesterday at the time of recording this again, Monday for those listening, or Tuesday for those listening. That's how days work. Um, but, but John, how should Florida feel about Quay Rousseau and James Smith at this point? Well, yeah, I think advantageous um, and, and smart for the Gators to get in the in-home visit. A lot of folks were trying to visit the Rousseau smith camp over the weekend because they were supposed to play in the Alabama-Mississippi All-Star game, which those practices began on Tuesday. They were no show. So Florida, obviously, in great communication with the duo, and they were able to visit with them while those practices began down in Mobile. Uh, So that was uh, really the biggest story of Tuesday, right? We check in, hey, who showed up for the All-Star game? Because on one end, obviously, any kid who's there, your visits are now now limited in terms of the schools that can come see you because they can't come to the hotel uh, down in Mobile, they have to come to your house or your school. So because of that, the Kelby Collinsons of the world, some of these other players that are playing in that game won't be able to kind of uh, get recruited. And maybe some of them did that on purpose to take a bit of a break. Rousseau and Smith did not. So on one end, yes, you're open for business during the week. And then on the back end, now they can take an official visit this weekend because that All-Star game was to take place Saturday afternoon, which would which would have really cut into any official visits they were planning to take. So now that they're not playing, they will take that Alabama official visit. So any other staff getting in this week, that that's huge, right? Um, Auburn, Florida, probably the two most important coaching staffs getting in with that duo. Uh, I think we've always talked about Auburn on this pod as the wild card for this duo. And that remains uh, today, even though Hugh Freeze is still assembling that defensive coaching staff, obviously, those guys are a priority. Cadillac Williams has already been retained. He's been uh, personally recruiting that that duo a little bit more uh, since he had that interim head coaching tag. So I think Auburn's going to factor in here down the stretch. Maybe they'll get uh, another official visit now that uh, the second coach has been hired at Auburn. So that's something to keep an eye on for the final visit weekend. Of course, at Florida, he's already, they've already taken the official. They've already taken the unofficial uh, for Friday Night Lights back in July. And I I think they've done a really good job hanging out in this top three. I I do think they've overtaken Georgia, which is something that I would not have said a month or two ago uh, regarding the duo. Uh, So I do think that's something that is, is in Florida's favor uh, again, but the ball does still feel like it's in Alabama's court, especially with that official visit this coming weekend. I do think if, if it's close, Alabama could kind of build out a bit of a lead with both of them on campus. However, what does that last weekend look like? And when does Billy Napier get up there to, to make his pitch? That's kind of the – that's what I'm waiting for. Um, at the end of the last cycle, right after Napier took the job, we found out the man can close. We, we found that out in a big way. Florida uh, had a, as good a finish as any first-year or new coaching staff at the time at the end of last cycle. How much of that will we see in this cycle, particularly out of state? We know they're doing well in Florida. They've got a top 10 class overall. 
But in Alabama and in Louisiana, where Napier has so many ties, how will the Gators close? I think all of the uh, icing on the cake type targets reside in, in those states. And obviously that would be huge news for Florida uh, to, to get one of the final head coach visits up to that duo. But until that point, I, I do still have my eye on Alabama as the favorite. Yeah. And just what does it mean for Florida to kind of be pushing for that close where it seems like the entire time that we've talked about them, it's been Florida's trying to eat up space. Florida's trying to gain, gain a little space there. Florida's trying to gain an advantage there. And in that in, uh, in-home visit that they took with at least Quay Rousseau, where he tweeted it out, where he posted a picture of it was him, it was Corey Raymond, it was Mike Peterson, it was Patrick Tony, it was Billy Napier, it was Sean Spencer. So you've got the head coach, you've got the two uh, defensive coordinators, one of them Everybody. maybe defensive line coach, you've got the outside linebackers coach, you've got your corners coach there, and of course Patrick Tony's also a safety coach. The only defensive coach that wasn't there was Jay Bateman, the off-ball linebacker coach. So what does that mean for Florida and, and kind of showing the the emphasis and the priority of getting Quay Rousseau and James Smith to Gainesville? Yeah, I was going to say it, it reemphasizes the level of, of priority and, and also how much Florida's got at stake in this race. Again, there was a lot of question marks as to whether or not these guys would be in Montgomery where they live or down in Mobile. Uh, so taking advantage that first day, I thought was really crafty, really crafty for Florida. Uh, we could have easily waited to make sure they didn't make the trip, and then you go ahead and, and set everything up. So to have already been there, I think does reaffirm not only the priority level, but the communication, the success and consistency of the communication between Florida and, and the camp of Rousseau and James Smith, which are, of course, of course so intertwined. There's so much overlap between those two same high school best friends same trainers a lot of a lot of folks in in the circle of each so re-emphasizing that level of priority and look let's be honest probably you know sitting down and re-emphasizing the ability to come in and play early uh and and showcasing some uh you know fellow players who did so in in 2022 on defense in particular right a lot of freshmen saw the field so you know all of those things are unique to florida especially compared to Alabama, Georgia, as we mentioned earlier, um, and and even Wildcard Auburn, which is overhauling the entire roster. So that that is something that I think is is unique to Florida relative to those other approaches. And again, you have to wonder how important that is down the stretch. We know with Rousseau, as we've talked about, his dad's a big Gators fan, um, and and they're about relationships. You know, I, I think there's one school of thought that says, look, these two don't like doing recruiting interviews. They don't like dealing with that part of the process. So would they have been committed to Alabama months ago, maybe years ago, if that was the foregone conclusion? There is one school of thought that says, yeah, they probably would have been on board there. Um, and on that same front, from from the Crimson Tide perspective, there's still some assistants that are being targeted by other schools uh, from, from Alabama's perspective, including on defense. So depending on how that shakes out, there, there could be a little – more light at the end of the tunnel from the Florida and or the Auburn angles uh, at the end of the day. So it feels like it's it's coming down to the wire. I think it's going to be hard for anyone to peg Alabama anywhere other than number one in this race, but I don't think it's 100% over. You, you wouldn't be – these type of kids wouldn't be fielding this much, much interest with in-home visits and taking trips, et cetera, if there wasn't considerable interest in potentially going elsewhere. They visited Auburn more than any other school. They visited Florida twice this year, back to Bama this weekend. It it really does feel more open than maybe our industry is suggesting. And obviously this whole cycle and recruiting in general has taught us we can't we can't get locked into thinking the favorites are are insurmountable in any recruiting battle, regardless of who's in in the mix. Uh, So I'm going to keep that approach with with Roussel, with Smith and everyone else. Today's episode of Locked On Gators is brought to you by LinkedIn. As the sun comes out and small businesses are back in business, LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier for you to grow your team. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy for you to find the people that you want to interview faster and for free. And if you've never used LinkedIn Jobs before, I highly recommend it. 
just just saying with simple tools like screening questions it makes it easier for you to focus on candidates with just the right skills and just the right experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire linkedin jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster and every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit linkedin Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Yeah, and then just sticking along the defensive line, Jordan Hall yesterday announced that he was setting his commitment date. It's December 22nd. He said, I know where I'm going. He's got his final four of Florida, Alabama, Georgia, LSU. And also, just for clarification, this is – Defensive lineman Jordan Hall for you listeners, not linebacker Jordan Hall, who's with Michigan State, not offensive tackle Jordan I was Hall, say. Colorado. This is the other other Jordan Hall here. Goodness, yeah. Let's uh, let's let's blame Michael Jordan for that. Uh, we're, we're still naming kids Jordan uh, left and right, boy and girl. By the way, um, yeah, this is a big one, uh, and I think the part of it about knowing where he wants to go is the most interesting, right? Look, we've we've viewed this one as, as a cocktail party battle, right? This is Florida, Georgia, Georgia, Florida, depending on your perspective. Uh, and him saying, I already know where I'm going, is very telling in, in two ways. One, his last official visit was to Florida this past weekend with, with mom, with dad, with a bunch of folks uh, coming down from Jacksonville. Uh, by all indication, it was a very successful trip. And it, it reemphasized one of the areas why – one of the areas that tell us why this time of year is so important for officials, you're not playing games. These coaches are free. They are focused. They're focused on the portal, obviously, but they're really focused on recruiting. And in person, you get so much more time, literally hours and hours more than you would ever get on a game weekend. And of course, last weekend, the Georgia coaching staff was pretty busy uh, in that SEC title game. So Florida, that's one of the perks, I guess, of not making it over to Atlanta, especially when you can get priority targets in town. Florida's done it all cycle. And and I think Hall uh, will be one of the more intriguing ones now that he has set his commitment date. So on one end, boom, I know where I'm going. Florida's last visit, whole family went very intimate with the coaching staff, everything looking good optically on that regard. On the other end, what if, (laughs) what if that visit clinched it for someone else? And we know he's got the Georgia official visit coming up this weekend. I will say prior to the trip to Gainesville, we we had heard more buzz about Georgia. Um, I think the other schools had started to kind of fade away just a little bit. And as, as soon as we thought it was more of a Georgia-Florida battle, it was probably in that order. Uh, so could you get confirmation on your school while visiting another school? Yes, that, that has happened in recruiting uh, as well. So I do think that's uh, something to keep an eye on. And and I know his father told 24-7 that maybe they take a fifth official. So that would be quite the wild card. Maybe it's Colorado and Dion. Uh, maybe it's one of these other new coaching staffs that are, are trying to make a late play. Um, you know, th- that's possible. But I do think uh, Jordan saying he knows where he's going is 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 probably more pointed to the SEC East between these two rivals. Um, probably too close to call on, on my end. Uh, I, I think I feel better about a few other players that that we've talked about or will talk about. Uh, but I do think from Florida's perspective, they've done just about all they could uh, in this race to keep another in-state elite home uh, versus uh, you know the biggest and best in college football. Yeah, and then flipping to the offensive side, but we'll stick in the trenches for this one because uh, there was one that was very interesting that came out yesterday. It was it was just on Twitter that they're like, oh, hey, he, he might flip from Texas to Florida, and it's Peyton Kirkland, oh, boy. Which, <laughs> which for me was very interesting because, and, and you can correct me if I'm misremembering this, um, but... To my knowledge, it was, you know, Florida, Oklahoma, Miami, Michigan State. And I believe there was a fifth school in there that wasn't Texas. Um, and Peyton Kirkland spent a whole bunch of time going, which one am I going to go to? And then teasing it on Twitter. And then as time came down to his commitment, um, a bunch of schools backed off. I know that. I'm, I'm pretty sure Florida backed off. 
Uh, I know I've, I've heard Oklahoma backed off. I've heard Michigan State backed off of him, and there was just not as much interest. And then rumors come out he's going to commit to Texas. He tweets, why would I commit to Texas? I've never visited them. And then he commits to Texas. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. What in the world is going on with Peyton Kirkland? Yeah, that's that's one of the most interesting ones, obviously, right? Uh, look, Texas has a great O-line class. Um, Kyle Flood's a really good O-line coach. Um, so you understand them having the ability to come into Orlando and, and pluck a great player. But yeah, from the other side of it, from Peyton's side of it, I mean, he's the ultimate wildcard kid. And that's saying a lot. We're talking about kids from the state of Florida. That's that's saying a lot that Peyton might be the biggest wild card. So what he says right now is that he's locked into Texas. Um, they do have the last visit lined up. He finally can take that official visit to Texas, I believe, next weekend. So not this weekend, right before signing day. He'll he'll be in Austin. But yeah, there's buzz with other programs trying to stay in the race and including Florida, we know there's a huge emphasis on the offensive line from the Gator perspective. They've been in the flip game before, uh, right? They, they flipped Rod Kearney from Florida state. They tried to flip Lucas Simmons uh, from Florida state as well. Uh, Tyree Adams, the LSU commitment, they're trying to flip actively. Um, so, so why not throw Kirkland into that grouping? Uh, so I, I'm not here to say that, just because he says he's 100% locked in that I believe that no other school is going to have a shot. We know every coaching staff is on the road and we know uh, Gainesville is closer to, to Orlando than just about everywhere else uh, that he's considering. So I'm not ready to say this thing is over yet. I do think he probably sticks with Texas um, only because he's got that last official visit set. So even if there are flirtations with Florida or anyone else in, in the short term, I do think that last visit will will sort of wrap things up uh, from his perspective. But visits can get canceled, as as we also see in, in recruiting. So just because something's planned doesn't mean it, it is going to go through. We see um, you know shows every weekend based on some of the commitment lists or, or visit lists that we track uh, in this great sport. So with Peyton Kirkland, take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, he says he's solid. We'll go with that for now, but yeah, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't going to refresh the old Twitter account of his uh, a time or two between now and, and National Signing Day. And we know there's a need, huge need at UF uh, to overhaul th this offensive line and bring in youth and versatile youth. And and for all of the the, the fun we have talking about Kirkland and his personality and, and his vibrance and all that, Pretty versatile player and massive, massive human being on top of it uh, who can play tackle, probably slide into guard, worst case at the next level. So that type of versatility at the Power 5 level, very, very coveted. And, and I expect other schools to just make sure, if you will, just make sure that Peyton is is set with, uh, with that recruitment. Yeah, you said that he said that he's locked in. So that means you're going to go with that for now. Him saying he's locked in makes me want to go the opposite direction. Be like, okay. He's flipping somewhere. I just don't know where. But um, today's episode of Lockdown Gators is brought to you by Bet Online. The Florida Gators are currently 10 and a half point underdogs against Oregon State in the Las Vegas Bowl on December 17th. I know I usually go, oh, but Florida's covered the spread every single time they were underdogs. I'm not going to say I'm banking on that one. I will say I don't know if I'm betting the spread either way because I don't know who Oregon State will have. Stuff could happen. So I will say this, though. The over-under is 52 and a half. I have already bet an alt, spread, an alt total of under 50 and a half. I think that there will be no shot they hit 50 unless Oregon State runs away with it or unless Florida, whoever starts a quarterback, ends up lighting it up. I don't think it'll happen, though. So Bet Online is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. Been very profitable for me lately. Thanks, Boyan, for yesterday. Appreciate you. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn all about the trends and action. Check out Bet Online. It's where the game starts. To wrap up today, we, we're going to talk about a position that we did not give like any attention to during this whole 2023 cycle because neither did Florida. Florida did not seem super intent on recruiting tight end. I know at a certain point I was told, hey, Florida's just not really interested in most of the 2023 tight ends, uh, regardless of whether or not you think they have a need. My point was always, 
They've got nine tight ends on roster to start this year. They've got Tony Livingston coming in in January, who, of course, was a 2022 kid, had surgery, never made it on campus, and is showing up in January. Uh, so you, then you've got 10 tight ends there, two transferred out. It, it's a lot. It's a very big room. You add Andrew Savayanaya to there now. He is also a tight end now. So now you've got 11 tight ends, four of them being freshmen. There's a lot going on there. But then on Tuesday, it came out that there is going to be an official visit from Flor- or from Jaden Platt to Florida, four-star tight end that was a Stanford commit. And of course, David Shaw no longer at Stanford, where he's produced so many NFL tight ends, but he's not there anymore. So that kind of changes the game a little bit for Stanford. This isn't the first tight end commit that they lost. So Jaden Platt visiting Florida uh, this weekend. So what what is the latest on Jaden Platt, who's a tight end from Texas, by the way, not even a Cali kid? Yeah, uh, look, you understand any kid committing to Stanford, right? That's something like my first month covering recruiting, you know, I, I kind of realized, look, when a kid gets that offer and it's legit, hard to say no based on the academics and and at his position, my goodness, even more so compared to others. But even though he committed a year ago, David Shaw's now gone, 12-year run there at Stanford, uh, no new hire uh, as of this morning uh, up, in, up in Northern California. So yeah, that thing's wide open because signing day is two weeks from today as we record. So naturally, a bunch of schools have, have, circled around uh, that commitment list to see what is available. And when you think of a a tight end, a versatile tight end, by the way, who is from the state of Texas, you're going to get more interest. So not only has Florida jumped in, Texas A&M is trying to get that final official visit out of Platt. Um, And obviously now, because Stanford theoretically will hire a new coach, he'll be able to take another official visit out there just to be sure uh, that he doesn't want to go play where he is intended to play for again, 12 months now. He committed December of 2021. So this is a unique situation. Uh, I do think uh, there's a lot to be said on this Florida staff relative to tight ends. I'm sure that's something Jaden and his family are going to ask about. Hey, uh, you didn't use them a whole bunch this year. What's going to be different here going forward? What is the plan? Uh, you know, I think that's going to be really important. Obviously, not not a dumb kid, right? Smart kid, uh, committed to Stanford, which means he's gotten in already. Uh, so I do expect uh, this thing to be kind of wide open, but uh, the ball will be in Florida's court first. Uh, I believe they're sending coaches to see him uh, on Wednesday as well. So this is not a casual recruitment. This isn't a let's take a flyer on a kid. They're they're putting resources and and dollars into traveling to Texas uh, and into getting in time with Platt and, of course, uh, hosting him for an official visit uh, this coming weekend. Of course, this will be his first visit to Gainesville. So there's just a lot of we don't know with with this recruitment at this point. But the effort from Florida is certainly there because the kid had a lot of options uh, even before he committed to Stanford. And obviously, once that David Shaw news came down, you know, dozens of coaching staffs were perusing that commitment list. So to, to only narrow it to two official visits right now, Florida and Texas A&M, says a lot about the effort that those two SEC schools have put in towards Platt. So get them on campus and, and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, and I, I would like to ask you a little bit about just early involvement from tight ends because you mentioned you know Florida didn't do much production-wise with tight ends. They used them basically sixth offensive lineman this year is, is how they went sixth and seventh with all the 12 personnel they were in. But right. one of the starting tight ends was a defensive end last year. And, and he was a starting tight end this year. So when you're a high school tight end and you mentioned, you know, what are you going to do with a tight end? Cause they weren't productive this year. I think they had like 20 catches combined this year. And right. most of them were Keon zipper who obviously plays the different tight end spot than Dante Sanders, not so much a blocker, but You've also got Arliss Boardingham is a big name in this room. You've got Jonathan Odom kind of broke out with a couple touchdowns late in the season. When you're a tight end, how do you even look at early involvement? Because I feel like you never really hear, outside of the Brock Bowers of the world, you never usually hear of a freshman tight end being an impact player. So how difficult is it to be like, okay, in two or three years, I'll be an impact player in this offense? Well, look, if you're if you're a Texas kid who's committed to Stanford for so long, uh, at that position, you know a couple things. One, it's about development, and, and you've got to be patient within that development. And two, 
you're you're going to be measured more as a blocker and an inline player first. I think that's what's so interesting about some of the schools that that have been involved with him. A lot of them want to flex out their tight ends. Well, Stanford doesn't want to. Florida doesn't want to anymore, right? Kyle Pitts era is over. So, you know, that's something he's already bought into once. Uh, so I do think there's something to be said for that. And, yeah, tight ends are not divas. I, I think, like you said, there's not a whole lot of precedent for pass catching tight ends to hit the ground running at the at the major power five level um it's it's almost you know we 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 view tight ends in recruiting as an extension of the offensive line like a lot of coaches view them positionally they're going to be about their business uh they're going to go in and and put in the work and and let the chips fall where they may thereafter so it's not um it's not unprecedented to see tight ends have some drama in their recruitment, um, but that's usually where it ends. There's not a whole lot thereafter, uh, very businesslike in their approach. So, yeah, it's not it's not a, as one-to-one as trying to sell a quarterback on a system or a running back on finding touches, even though ETN and Johnson are coming back and saying, hey, good, you know, good luck to you trying to find touches there. It's not that simple at the tight end position. It, it is much more about the vision, about the long-term plan and play from, from the coaching staff. A lot more belief and buy-in has to happen w- between both parties, really, when recruiting these spots. And Platt is, you know, he's a guy who's who's going to add weight to his frame, and he knows he needs to do that as well. So I, I don't want to make it seem like this is a, you know, 6'6", 250-pound uh, Dallas Goddard kind of guy <laughs> coming in right now. It, it's not quite that either. So I think it works both ways from the development standpoint. Uh, obviously, education is important to this kid on top of it. Uh, so you understand how that could be a strong factor for the Gators as well. But yeah, tight ends usually a little bit more straightforward in recruiting, let, less diva in them. But when their coach leaves, uh, you, you know, obviously you have to consider all your options. Uh, ju- I just want you to know I'm upset that you wanted to bring up an Eagles tight end to do that. I'm a Giants bro. fan, so I, I'm I pretty mean, come on. about I mean, that one. There's uh, no giant pass catcher that I'm willing to bring up on a podcast. I'm sorry. That's that's fair. <laughs> that is a good point there. But uh, thank you so much, John. This is John Garcia, Lockdowns Recruiting Insider. Hopefully, by the time you're listening to this, DJ Lagway is a Florida Gator. Um, hopefully. I'm, I'm going to just say – I I am happy for it, but I am fully prepared to be upset. But thank you so much, John, and you'll be back here. And hopefully next time you're back here, DJ Lagway will be a Florida Gator. Yes, sir. Sounds good, Brandon. Thanks for having me.